one of the most dramatic finds we made is in the church of uh, St. Martin de Vic in France. And there's a dramatic fresco. Jesus is walking towards the wall, the towers of Jerusalem, and the youth are cutting down with long knives, mushroom caps, which are also present on the next scene, the Last Supper. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savannah Podcast. We've got a really interesting and perhaps even controversial show in store for today. We're going to talk about entheogen use within various traditions, but in particularly within the Christian tradition. Our guest is Dr. Jerry Brown. He's an educator, anthropologist, and activist for who for over 40 years was the founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, where he taught a course on hallucinogen and culture. He's also co-authored a book called The Psychedelic Gospels, and he's here today to talk about his research and his findings. Excited to have him on the show. Jerry, welcome. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So you obviously knew about visionary plant use in in shamanic cultures and shamanic religions, uh, but you were on a vacation with your wife when you you recognized a the the symbol of a of a mushroom on a green man statue that seemed to kind of spark this this big adventure that you went on to to dive further into symbolism within particularly the Christian religion. Tell us a little bit about your your story, uh, your your background, and, and how you started this this really adventure that you went on? Well, um, I've been a profounding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami uh, from 1972 to 2014 when I retired. I was trained at Cornell in anthropology. And I really designed and taught this course, Hallucinogens and Culture, after my first uh, somewhat unsettling LSD experience with the Rainbow family, Uh, high in the mountains of Colorado. The course covered both the early and classical cultures, including the identification of the enigmatic soma plant in the Hindu Rig Veda as a psychoactive Amanita muscaria mushroom. And then the second part of the course would go into the modern mind explorers, uh, the Albert Hoffman, the Timothy Learys, the Terence McKenna's of the world, and what their discoveries were and why they kind of reoriented their lives around entheogens once they became aware of their uh, incredible power to open up portals to the divine. Uh, So having this background and especially researching things from an interdisciplinary perspective, from art history, from anthropology, from mythology, from theology, uh, when Julie and I my wife, Julie, and co-author, in 2006 visited Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. We were drawn there by the reference to it in Dan Brown's uh, best-selling book, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, I was surprised, I would say astonished, to find a very prominent psychoactive mushroom, Amanita muscaria, sculpted upside down into the forehead of the most prominent green man at Roslyn, right above the sacred altar uh, in the front of Roslyn. And Roslyn Chapel is a Catholic church. So this kind of started our head spinning. What, what is going on here? What is Saint Sir William Sinclair, the founder and designer of Roslyn in the, in the 1400s, trying to tell us? Is there some message here about the use of psychedelics, which I, as you prefer to call entheogens, plants and chemicals that generate the divine within? Is there something going on here in the history of Christianity? And that's a big statement, uh, psychedelics in Christianity. And so we were tempered, our enthusiasm was tempered by the um, words of the famous astrophysicist Carl Sagan, who said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. And for years, Julie and I grappled, should we undertake this arduous and expensive journey of traveling and researching and documenting and photographing and looking for psychedelic images in Christian art 
in churches and cathedrals throughout Europe and the Middle East. And finally, we decided to undertake this. And to our surprise, in the nine major sites, small chapels, high holy places, cathedrals, we found compelling visual evidence of psychedelics in Christian art. By that, I mean in mosaics, in frescoes, in illuminated manuscripts, in stained glass windows. And that's what gave rise to our theory of the psychedelic Gospels, that indeed uh, entheogens played a role in the origins and history of Christianity. Well, and I want to point out as well that, I mean, obviously for some people, this might be a sensitive topic. And you yourself and your wife, you guys are very concerned with making sure that this stuff is rigorously looked at, that it's not, you're not just some rogue trying to stir the pot, as it were. You guys really care about like, hey, here's the evidence we're presenting. We want art historians to look at it. We want um, theologians to look at it. Like you, you're really encouraging that dialogue, which is something that I appreciate because you, you talk about it throughout your book book. And that's something where, hey, you're not just trying to, to, to bring out this crazy theory and, hey, you're standing alone, but really want to cooperatively engage in dialogue about it, which is, which is really great, I think. Yeah, well, I, I think there's absolutely, and there's two points. One, we have found stunning and compelling evidence of psychedelics in all of the nine sites that we visited, from tiny chapels in France to high holy places such as Canterbury Cathedral, an illuminated manuscript, illuminated Bible, and which is an illustrated Bible, and in the stained glass windows of Chart, Chart Cathedral, uh, all the way to the obscure cave churches of Turkey where early Christians started to flee Roman persecution as early as the first century. Uh, some of these images are so precise that ethnobotanists can tell what the variety of psychoactive mushroom it is, whether it's an Amanita muscaria um, from the Amanita family, or whether it's one of the 40 varieties, psychoactive varieties, uh, psilocybin containing varieties from the Liberty Cap to the landslide mushrooms, etc. We We put that out. And we say this is a major find, especially since Pope Gregory back in the early century said the illustration and drawings are going to be the Bible for the illiterate, for the uneducated, which was most of the population at that time. So here in what was the visual Bible, we found compelling evidence of psychedelics. So we put this forth, we put forth a theory of the psychedelic gospels, and we asked people with an open mind and open heart to evaluate the information. We also recognize that if we are correct, and we are convinced we are correct, then this is a discovery on par with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Gnostic gospels. Hmm. And we believe it should be evaluated by the international scientific community with the same kind of rigor that those uh, incredible historical biblical finds were examined. And therefore, in the appendix to our book and in the book, we call for the establishment of an interdisciplinary committee to collect, examine, evaluate, and have a transparent discussion about the theory of the psychedelic gospels. Now, before we, we dive further into it, I, I want to just define two terms because we've, we've used them both. And for people that might be a little less familiar um, in this conversation, can you can you help describe the difference between an entheogen and a psychedelic or the terms of what those phrases mean and then why we would use them differently? Sure. Well, psychedelics is obviously the popular term. And we've had the use of psychedelics, we've had the use of, of psychomimetics, uh, we've had the use of, of psychoactive substances. Uh, because of the negative associations placed on psychedelics, especially since they were regulated uh, under the Controlled Substances Act, many of them were regulated in 1970, starting in the late 60s, uh, scientists and particularly people who, who work in the field uh, Gordon Wasson, Carl Rook, uh, developed the phrase entheogens, to be more precise. And this comes from the Greek en, within, theo, deos, god, and gen, generate. So chemicals and plants that generate a sense of the divine within. So 
so that's the that's the word that we use in this particular case and we're talking about a wide variety of of substances certainly the amanita muscaria uh which is in a family that contains the amanita some very deadly mushrooms so people need to be very uh careful about the identification of plants in that area um certainly the um Ergot cleviceps perpea, which is found in the Eleusinian Mysteries. Uh, to be sure, the, um, the Amazonian drink, uh, ayahuasca, from the plant Banisteriopsis capi. Uh, definitely uh, the uh, mescaline-containing uh, peyote. Uh, the wide variety of psilocybin-containing plants, uh, the paniolis, the psilocybes, etc. And uh, those are some of the, the main plants that we are talking about here that are within psychedelics. And and I just want to stress, these are not drugs in the way that our society knows drugs. They certainly are not the addictive drugs of heroin, alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, methamphetamine. And in fact, in one of the great ironies uh, in the current research under the new science of psychedelics, uh, researchers are finding that uh, a number of these entheogens, particularly psilocybin, helps people overcome addiction. So this is why it is important to distinguish the class of entheogens, which are non-toxic, which are non-addictive, from the uh, more common street uh, drugs that we know and of causing tremendous addiction problems in our society. Well, I'm sure we could spend more than a single episode talking about the the cultural fears around entheogens and things like that and what happened in the 60s and everything else. Um, so there's that's a huge rabbit hole to dive down in. I definitely want to stay in this realm of your book because the book reads kind of like a detective novel. You kind of you guys go through this this whole process together and you're discovering things. Um, well, what I, where I would l- kind of like to start with that, though, is why for for listeners. Why should uh, or, or why might Christians care about this? And, and as well, why would non-Christians care about it? like what what's the what's the why with with this information to say like, OK, there, there are images of entheogens. Why should people care? Right. Well, to come back to the first part of your question, this reads like a novel. And we were very pleased with uh, one uh, person who reviewed the book. Uh, Don Latin, who, who's a best-selling author on the Harvard of the Harvard Psychedelic Club, he said, "It's the Da Vinci Code meets the Electric Acid Kool Aid Test." <laughs> and the reason why we wrote this as uh, not only academically sound, well researched, but also inviting reach- research readers, inviting readers to come along with us on the adventure of discovery and be right there in the scenes in the in the. Uh, church in the chapel in the, of, of uh, St. Martin de Vic in France is because the books that have been written in this area are typically very arcane, very academic, very dense, not accessible to the general public. We wanted something that was both academically sound and readable so, so a wide uh, audience could be uh, engaged in this theory of the psychedelic gospels. Why is it important uh, to Christians? Because this tradition was not suppressed. It was went on in secret, see, from the early church up to the period of the late Inquisition, which is the period when these images begin to disappear from Christianity, um, let's say, in the 14th and 15th uh, centuries. And so if we have a tradition going back into early Christianity, and as we argue in the book, based on a reinterpretation of the uh, New Testament Gospels and the Gnostic Gospels, even in the life of Jesus and the disciples, then I think it's important for people from the Judeo-Christian tradition to be reunited with the fact that visionary plants were a portal to the divine, a direct experience of the divine presence. In that context, we do not see and did not write this to challenge all of the beautiful faith and and rituals and sacraments of Christianity, but rather in hopes of reintroducing Jews and Christians alike to a part of the Old and New Testament tradition 
that would be direct experience of the divine and enhance faith. Why this is important is because we find that even today in the Santo Dime Church of Brazil, which uses ayahuasca, which is an entheogen in its religious rituals, and they see this as the, the kind of the, the substance of Jesus that was put here on earth, the bishops of Brazil have endorsed this practice. So we find that it is coming back in some areas into Christianity. Uh, Santo Dime and the related Unao Vegetal, Union Vegetal, um, have been given the right to use ayahuasca in their ceremonies here in the United States, just as the 300,000 members of the Native American Church who use peyote in their rituals also have a legal right under the Supreme Court. So in essence, this is not something that is a challenge. It's definitely conceptually a challenge and is very going to be very controversial. Let's make no, let's not have any illusions about that. But as we cite in the book, Catholic brother David Stendhal Rost of the Order of St. Benedict writes, because I have faith in the church's traditional sacraments, I ought to be able to stretch that faith to include the possibility of encountering God through all available sacraments. Mm -hmm. Faith simply accepted with gratefulness that God works through all created things. All, question mark, if we can encounter God through a sunrise seen from a mountaintop, why not through a mushroom prayerfully ingested? Mm -hmm. So in that respect, we believe this is something that can be vital to both Jewish and Christian communities. There is a Jewish element to this, uh, but we did not have time in the scope of this book to really delve into that deeply, but we cite the references. What about for the larger community? What about for the many, many people today, um, many youth who say, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. What about the people who are atheistic uh, or agnostic who say, you know, you can't prove to me that there's any d direct experience of the divine. Well, I would like to say two things to that. <laughs> I'd like to say that, that Julie and I had our first uh, experience of God or the divine, whatever term you'd like to use, as a presence that permeates the entire universe while uh, through entheogens back in the 60s and 70s. And number two, uh, in this era of skepticism and uh, concern and, and, you know, I, I don't believe and you can't show it to me, it is amazing to, rediscover, to rediscover this ancient pathway to the divine. I am not saying by any means that this is the only pathway. Obviously, meditation is a fabulous pathway. Service, life of service, such as Mother Teresa, joyful immersion of one's life in the, in the incredible expression of God that Rumi gave us. And in, in Deepak Chopra's beautiful book, God, A Story of Revelations, he describes four pathways to the God, to, to the divine, for people who are eager for God. But he doesn't look at entheogens, uh, even though they are rooted in his Hindu tradition of the Rig Veda. So in summary, what I'm saying that here's a direct portal to the divine that people can experience and that can bring them back to a sense of complete connection with all sentient beings and entities in the cosmos with a sense of cosmic consciousness um, that was most beautifully articulated in the New Testament uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. Well, and I, and I like you, I'm, I'm a big advocate of responsible entheogen use. I, I had experiences early on uh, in my life as well that, that led to this dance between, okay, well, we can experience things through the, the, the particular energies of these medicines. At the same time, we can experience them through deep meditation and various breathing practices and this and that. So they're, they're all there, but they support the, this common goal of, of truth and, and getting to know God or the divine, which I think is something that, that that personal direct experience is missing from a lot of modern Western lives where that leads so many people to this idea of atheism that, hey, you know, there is no God, you can't prove it. I haven't had an experience of it. And 
that, that's not to put atheism down at all, but just to say like, hey, it, it makes sense that if you don't connect with something personally, you're going to have a hard time uh, accepting it in any sort of way. But these give you very direct experiences of that, which is why they've been used through by cultures throughout history. Let me make one other point here, Ashton, course, if yeah. I may. Yeah. Uh, in one of the most incredible unifications of science and religion, uh, we have a chapter in the book called The Miracle of Marsh Chapel. Yeah. And in that chapter, we start out, uh, well, it starts out by describing a very powerful and positive uh, psilocybin experience I had in Jamaica. But it goes on to describe uh, what's known as the Miracle of Marsh Chapel or the Good Friday Experiment, which was conducted by Walter Pankey uh, in about 1962 at Marsh Chapel. And what he did was he was a graduate student in Harvard Divinity. He took two groups of Divinity students and he put them in a little small chapel underneath Marsh Chapel where the sermon and the music was piped in on Good Friday. One group was given psilocybin. The other group was given niacin B12 which would make you feel flushed. Nine out of 10 of the people in the psilocybin group had powerful religious and mystical experiences versus one in the control group. Mm -hmm. And that carried on into their lives six months later. And even 25 years later, in a follow-up study conducted by Rick Doblin, who is the founder of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, Org, maps.org, which is at the forefront a lot of most of much of the medical and scientific research on psychedelics going on today. So we even have not only the ancient traditions from the Hindu Rig Veda, from many, um, many, many uh, different uh, shamanistic uh, traditions that go all the way from peyote among the American Indians to psilocybin among the Mazatec of Oaxaca, and I could go on and on. But we also have direct scientific verification in a gold standard double blind controlled study that was conducted and has withstood the test of time. So this is what's exciting about the present and the past sort of coming together in our research. And for those of your listeners interested in our book, you can find it on Amazon under Psychedelic Gospels or through our website, psychedelicgospels.com. Yes. And and I, I appreciate you mentioning the the Good Friday experiment, the miracle of the Marsh Chapel, because that was something I was going to ask you about as well. Bringing it back a little bit more to the, the imagery, you, I think it was uh, you mentioned Pope Gregory uh, as the one that was talking about the the visual side being this way of teaching people. So my 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 question that comes up from that is why put these images in there? Like what uh, is it? Is it just pointing towards something in the past, or is it talking about an esoteric tradition? Like why why would they put these images all throughout all these locations that you mentioned? What do you feel is the the reason behind it? Well, first of all, I think that these images relate to powerful pathways to the divine that were practiced among the elite. By that, I mean the initiates and church keepers of Christianity and also for the pagan royalty, who were the patrons of these churches who were involved with this. So this was done because what we find throughout much of the shamanic tradition. These are the the holy of the holies, the most holy substances that God put here on earth to be, uh, give us a direct experience. And this is so found in the Eleusinian mysteries where someone would be condemned to death if they ever spoke about what happened to them after they drank the kikion, the the LSD potion-like kikion uh, that was found in, used in the Eleusinian mysteries. So one, uh, what they're doing is they're saying to the initiate, to the people who have knowledge, that here is our tradition and we're putting it out here visually on the church walls, in the frescoes, in the ceiling paintings, in the stained glass windows. One, to let you know about it so we can instruct you about it and to pass it on to future generations. And sometimes it's enigmatic. For example, on the cover of our book, you have God creating plants, which comes from the great Canterbury Psalter, an illuminated Bible 
uh, done in the Canterbury Scriptorum, where Bibles were made around 1180. Um, and God is actually creating four psychoactive plants. And it's very dramatic, and it's very compelling. In the great Canterbury Psalter, in plate 14, healing the leper, the scroll in the leper's left, left hand says, Master, if you want, you may cleanse me. And Jesus says in the scroll he's holding out in Latin, I want to be cleansed. But the scroll from the leper's hand is going not to Jesus, but to a psilocybin, a very distinct psilocybin mushroom. So what's happening here is that we're seeing the instruction given in the visual images of the early and medieval church, that these plants can be used as a pathway to the divine, they can be used in healing ceremonies, and they can uh, tell us about the role of psychedelics. One of the most dramatic finds we made is in the church of uh, St. Martin de Vic in France. And there's a dramatic photo, a dramatic fresco of Jesus sitting on the donkey entering Jerusalem. And the joyous youth who are greeting him are holding on to five large, distinct, tan, smooth mushroom caps. Jesus is walking towards the wall, the towers of Jerusalem on the next wall. And the youth are cutting down with long knives, mushroom caps, which are also present on the next scene, the Last Supper. And this was stunning to us when we both translated the Latin in the uh, script, uh, in the scrolls, and saw the evident visual imagery so dramatically connecting Jesus directly with psychedelic psilocybin mushrooms. And this gave rise to our aha moment of the psychedelic gospels. That's in a chapter called The Prophet Has Spoken. We believe that this message has been there. Uh, the earliest we found was from 300 AD in the Church of Aquileia in northern, uh, northwestern Italy. And when it comes back to the earlier time, there is no Christian art before 200. So we had to go back with mushroom eyes and look at the New Testament and the Gnostic Gospels to see if many of the enigmatic sayings of Jesus and his disciples would make sense if we presumed that they were talking about psychoactive plants. And that's in the chapter in the book called The Kingdom of Heaven. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you get into the, the Gnostic Gospels in the book, uh, and that, that might be the, the very chapter that you mentioned, which I think is also very fascinating because the, the, the Gnostic Gospels are often very much linked to their similarities of, of Eastern traditions and beliefs, uh, which again, as you mentioned, there, there's um, people like yourself and, and many, many others that believe that within the Rig Veda, the Soma that they're talking about is linked to Amnita Muscaria or Fly Agaric. Uh, I, I personally, having kind of being on both sides of the conversation of both scholars completely within the tradition and practitioners who say, no, 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 this is completely an inner experience, has nothing to do with you know, outside plant use, which I can appreciate. At the same time, I've had so many experiences with Amnita muscaria, it's impossible not to draw the connections if you've actually experienced these things of how the similarity between the languages that people are using, the things they're talking about, the experiences they're talking about, and the very specific experience with, in this case, Amnita muscaria, which is a different experience than, than psilocybin or a different experience than ayahuasca. They have their own kind of flavors and energies, as it were. And so it's very interesting to, to see those, those connections. Um, now, you... you let, let, let me... Can I make a point uh, here? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the Gnostic Gospels, which lay under the sands, you know, they, when, once the Orthodox Church around 200 assumed power and it persecuted the Gnostics and other people who were not of the true faith. And it burned their books and it condemned them. These Gnostic Gospels were buried uh, near the t upper Nile t uh, city uh, town of Nag Hammadi. Uh, and they lay there for over 1,500 years before they were discovered by some Arab shepherds. And then they were translated and eventually, you know, came into English. But listen to this phrase from the uh, not Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. And Jesus tells Thomas they have both received knowledge from the same source. I quote from the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said to his disciples, compare me to someone and tell me whom I am like. 
Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Jesus said, I am not your master. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have measured out. Who he who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I shall become like he and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Now, obviously, Jesus is talking about a drink and he's talking about a dose of that drink that he has measured out. So here's a direct reference. And this is obviously not wine. I mean, this transpersonal experience in which they both fuse into another reality uh, certainly is more like an atheogen than, than any other substance. And you're absolutely right, Ashton, because one of the things that the Gnostic Gospels tell us that's dramatically different from the interpretation of the um, canonical Gospels uh, whose foundations were established by the Council of Nicaea uh, early on in the history of Christianity is that one God and man are one, are not separate. Mm -hmm. Number two, the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus says in the Bible, is within. And number three, Jesus did not come to save man from sin. He came to teach enlightenment. So here we are looking at a tradition that seems to be more Eastern than Western. And number two, we trace it, and we don't discount the possibility that Jesus could have traveled to India during the long period of the missing years. But we believe that he, he garnered these teachings uh, during a sojourn in Egypt. And we have to recognize that Christianity emerged from a circum-Mediterranean area that was rife with mystery cults, shamanic traditions, many of which uh, used uh, psychoactive sacraments in their religious practices from the well-known Eleusis in Greece to other places. So we find direct passages in the Bible and in the Gnostic gospel that don't make sense otherwise. I mean, Jesus saying in uh, John uh, 6, 51 through 56, he that eateth of my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth within me and I in him. Or whoever eats my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Now. Is Jesus talking about cannibalism? Apparently not, because that would have been repugnant to Jews and to Romans alike. We believe he's talking about the, the flesh of a psychoactive plant and the juice of it um, as possibly the original Eucharist. Well, what's interesting to me as someone who, who's been immersed most of my life in the, the, the spiritual traditions of coming from the East and the practices is, is I hear the voice, you know, out there and within me that says, well, no, no, they're, they're talking in metaphor and it's so much more than that. And I, and I can appreciate that perspective, but as someone who's also had a, a, a very long appreciation and practice with entheogens, it, it's too hard not to also make those connections to say like, well, you know, it, there, there's so many double meanings in things. To me, it, there's absolutely room for both because I think they, they support one another so dramatically and so profoundly, which is why they've been used for, I mean, as far back as history goes with the, the spiritual and religious experience, which I think is, is really powerful. Sure. I mean, to go back into the Eastern tradition and to go into the Hindu Rig Veda written down in the Sanskrit some 3,500 years ago, coming from a long oral tradition, uh, one entire mandala of the 10 mandalas in the, 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 the Rig Veda uh, says the most famous verse of all, we have drunk Soma, which is the psychoactive Amanita mushroom. We have drunk Soma and become immortal. We have attained the light the gods discovered. What now can foeman's malice do to harm us? What, O oh, immortal, mortal man's deception? So what they're saying, we fear nothing. We have drunk the Soma. We have attained the light. We have become immortal. And that's why we say in the book that we believe our theory of the psychedelic gospels. Jesus awakened to his divinity and immortality through a visionary plant. And this doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't divine or Jesus, Jesus wasn't unique in world history. It's just that we believe there's a compelling argument when you look at the art and then look at the canon gospels and the Gnostic gospels through these mushroom eyes that this is an, a, a very 
plausible interpretation. Obviously, we're not going to have any smoking gun from the time of Jesus and the disciples. And obviously, there have been multiple. I mean, there have been more, more written on the Bible than any other book in world history. But we believe this is a plausible explanation. And for those who disagree with us, we simply say, read our book with an open heart and an open mind and look at those images and give us a different explanation of why those images are there. Now come up with a more plausible ex- explanation. Uh, we believe this is the most viable uh, explanation. Well, and you, you, you make the case throughout the book. And so, as you say, I mean, I, I encourage others as well to, to get your book. Uh, I remember even in, in preparation for this, I had posted something on our, on our Facebook page and someone already went out and got it because they were super excited about the idea as well. And you really go into it and state it clearly for people that want to kind of take that more scholarly route to, to look at each thing. I, I want to change directions just a, a little bit because you also talk about it in your book. It, it was just recently Christmas here, um, at the time of this recording, you talk a little bit about the the Santa Claus story and its relationship to Amnita Muscaria, the, the reindeer herders. I was wondering if you could kind of summarize a little bit of that for us, given uh, how close we are to that holiday. Sure, absolutely. Um, we, we go into four major discoveries of psychedelics in early religion in the first part of the book called um, about the first religion. We go into the Soma of the Rigveda. We go into the Eleusinian mysteries of ancient Greece, which were practiced for 2,000 years until the coming of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. And we go into a living mushroom cult among the Mazatec of Mexico. And the title of the chapter is Maria Sabina and the Little Saints, which is the name that the Mazatecs gave to these psilocybin mushrooms that they use in healing. We also go into the Amanita uh, reindeer, reindeer herder uh, complex that is found from time immemorial among the reindeer herders of Siberia who still use the Amanita uh, mushroom today. And our suggestion is that our contemporary image of Santa Claus, you know, as a jolly white bearded fellow in a red suit with white fur trim, the red and the white being the characteristic colors of the Amanita muscaria psychoactive mushroom, that that is a modern version of the archetypal uh, Siberian mushroom shaman. Uh, To go a little further, um, when the shaman collects the soma, or, or Amanita muscaria, we call it soma throughout the book, that the best effects are when the mushrooms are dried before consumption. So he originally initially hangs the fresh fungi out on the branches of pine trees, and they grow right underneath the pine tree in a symbiotic relationship because the spores of the Amanita take root, so to speak, in the humus, decaying humus of the pine trees, and then when it rains, they pop up. So these are like the colorful ornaments that decorate the Christmas tree. Then after he's collected his his sack full of mushrooms in his sack, he puts them on his sleigh and his team of reindeer, pulls them back to his yurt or his teepee. So here comes Santa's sleigh full of toys pulled by flying reindeer. Uh, In the winter, snow drifts can cover the yurt's main entrance, so the shaman enters through the smoke hole, over the snow, through the smoke hole on top, Santa coming down the chimney to deliver his gifts to the very appreciative uh, members of his his clan. To further dry the mushrooms, they string them up around the fireplace, and in the morning, they have a ritual feast of dried magic mushrooms, Christmas gifts placed in the stockings over the fireplace. Once they ingest these mushrooms, the uh, reindeer herder celebrants leave the physical plane and are transported to the mystical realms of the cosmos, uh, guided by the spirits that live within the mushrooms, Santa's little helpers, the elves that live at the North Pole, and they're carried away by flying reindeer. And so we have this tradition, and Russian archaeologists have found um, figures carved on rock walls near in Siberia in the areas of the reindeer herders showing uh, the mushroom people with, with huge mushroom uh, figures on top of their heads which are the spirit of the mushrooms. And these are often found on carvings of flying reindeer, found on carved monoliths throughout Mongolia. So we believe that every major theme of the modern Santa story can be traced back to the shamanic reality of ingesting psychoactive 
Amanita muscaria, that a tradition that went on for thousands and thousands of years uh, deep in the forests and, and boreal forests of Siberia. And that practice still goes on today. Well, and you mentioned as well uh, in your book, you, you talk about a story with your with your wife where you guys were visiting these reindeer. And I think it's it's worth mentioning that the, that one, Amnita muscaria, the, the visionary component is not broken down in urine. So people would often drink urine from either the wealthy people or the shamans or in particular, even the reindeer, because apparently the reindeer love eating Amnita muscaria as well. And you had a, a funny exchange with your wife in a connection to the, to the one reindeer that, that loved eating the Amnita muscaria. Yeah, this was one of the many synchronicities, uh, kind of meaningful coincidences that happened along the trip that just kind of said, we are really in the flow with this research. I mean, the universe kind of has our back and we keep getting signs and symbols that we connect to real world research. So we went uh, during that trip when we went to Roslyn Chapel, we went up into the Cairngorms, the highest mountains in Scotland, and we visited uh, a reindeer herd that's way up in the mountains. Uh, and we were taken by guides from the reindeer center uh, in the Cairngorm Park. And so there's this one albino reindeer that's standing off to the side, not interacting, not even feeding. And the uh, reindeer guides told us that, that his name was Circus. They named all of the reindeer, Elvis and Gandhi and Styx. It was very cute. And um, we had, they gave us pellets to feed the reindeer. And so this one reindeer said, we asked, why is he off on the side? And the uh, Beth the uh, reindeer guide said, oh, his name is Circus, and all the reindeer love mushrooms, and they eat them during the season, but he's sort of the Timothy Leary of reindeers. <laughs> he gorges on them, and he kind of stands out there mesmerized, staring in the sun, at the sun, and that's why his, his face is so pink. He's, he's sunburned. And then that right after that, that reindeer, who doesn't interact very often, came over to Julie and started looking in her eyes and eating the, um, the reindeer food, out of her hand. Uh, and it was quite an introduction to that. We also learned through the research of R. Gordon Wasson, uh, who wrote the, the analysis in his book, Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality, identifying the Soma among the reindeer herders and in the Rig Veda, that the psychoactive substances in Amanita muscaria, the muscimol and the ebotenic acid, are not metabolized well by the body. Mm -hmm. So that they pass out into the urine and someone who drinks the urine of the shaman um, can have a similar experience. And this was a real en enigma for the people who translated the Rig Veda from the Sanskrit into the German and the French and the Italian over 200 years ago is why are they talking is Indra, you know, coming and pissing out Soma, talking about like a stag. Indra is pissing out Soma, assuming her, mice, her most powerful force. And from, from an anthropological point of view, this is pretty repugnant, but they drank the urine. Mm -hmm. And Wasson, R. Gordon Wasson in Soma, uh, translates tales of, of soldiers of fortune and missionaries and, and uh, uh, soldiers who were up in Siberia and actually witnessed reindeer herders holding out their cups to collect and drink the urine of the shaman so they could have similar powerful Visions. Uh, there is an, a kind of a, a, an old tale about a, um, a prince going through the forest in India and he's seeking enlightenment. And he comes upon this beggar and the beggar says to him, what are you seeking, oh great prince? And he says, I'm seeking enlightenment. And the beggar says, you know, drink my urine and you will be enlightened. And the prince is outraged and storms off. But it was really one of the Hindu gods offering enlightenment uh, to the prince. So it's a very... Uh, interesting and fascinating tradition when you uh, get into it. Absolutely. Well, I, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I, I enjoy your book because it, it does read so much like a, a detective novel. And you guys, and you, you talk about Watson, you, you you praise some of his work, and you also talk about some of the, the shortcomings and things like that. So it's, it's a really fascinating read for people that are are interested in this topic. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, but let's let's state it again, the best way for, for people to connect with you, the work that you do, your book, and so forth, that would be through your, your website, psychedelicgospels.com. Yes, psychedelicgospels.com. 
dot com. You can go on our website. You can see our videos. You can see news uh, of information. You can read our blogs. You can see our image gallery of some of the many images uh, we've collected. And you can sign up uh, to be receiving our newsletter and, and periodic updates. Uh, so you can buy the book through our website, but you can also go directly to Amazon and look under Psychedelic Gospels and you'll be able to buy our book in either a Kindle uh, e-version or as a paperback. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for being on the show, Jerry. To all our listeners out there, I hope this has sparked curiosity and interest in you and you continue down exploring the possibilities. Um, check out Jerry Brown's book and um, continue asking questions. Thank you all so much for listening today. I hope you have a very present moment. Namaste. Hey everybody, it's Ashton here with an announcement. We're starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter into the contest to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, we'd really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes, left us a review, leave us some comments, and share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. Also want to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of a Facebook group where I interact with guests and our audience will post recent episodes up there as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and or the topics on the shows. And again, thank you so much for listening. Namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.